All right, we're going to begin, and those who uh, who are going to join us as we proceed will do so. Uh, so, friends, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this very special webinar, which in this instance, we are commemorating a Jewish American Heritage Month which is the month of May and has been declared as such by every president since President George Bush. And uh, just recently at the 1st of May, we had a declaration by President uh, Joe Biden. Uh, today's webinar appropriately is titled The Presidents, The Press, and American Jury. And we have a very special guest, wonderful teacher, America's preeminent Lincoln scholar and my friend, Harold Holzer, whose new book, The Presidents Versus the Press, The Endless Battle Between the White House and the Media from the Founding Fathers to Fake News, has been hailed by the Washington Post as, quote, a lively, deeply researched story filled with colorful detail. Friends, uh, for those we who have we have not yet met. I'm Gary Zola, and I am the executive director of the Jacob Rader Marcus Center of the American Jewish Archives and a professor of American Jewish history at the historic Hebrew Union College. Hebrew Union College, the oldest continuously existing institution of higher Jewish learning in the Western Hemisphere. And it's my pleasure to welcome you this afternoon to this very special program. First of all, we want to extend a, an extra special welcome to those of you who are joining our webinar for the very first time. If you are unfamiliar with who we are, the American Jewish Archives, created 75 years ago by the Hebrew Union College, is physically located in Cincinnati, Ohio, at the Hebrew Union College's campus and was founded by Dr. Jacob Rader Marcus, the distinguished historian and pioneering scholar of American Jewish history. And since its founding in 1947, the American Jewish Archives has now become the world's largest freestanding research center dedicated solely to the study of the American Jewish experience. Now, before I introduce our distinguished guests who will be teaching us this afternoon, Permit me to mention just a few technical matters uh, relating to the webinar itself. At various times during this webinar together, uh, we will share screen. And I just wanna remind all of you when that happens that you will see a vertical bar sort of on the right-hand side of your screen that runs from the top to the bottom. And you can move that bar to the right or to the left, which will let you see either more of us or more of the documents that we're going to put up. Uh, on your screen, you will be of course viewing just the speakers and uh, you, some of you will note that uh, uh, the chat feature is on. Uh, the speakers and our staff can see your chat and we hope that during the presentation, you will pose questions. We will harvest those questions and we will try our very best to answer all of the questions that you have or as many as we can later in our hour. Now, you also may be noticing some of you that uh, there is a feature offered uh, of closed captioning. This is uh, something we make available so that the, those of you who can, uh, who want to use it and need to use it, have it. Uh, this is something you can control for yourself. It can be turned on and off simply by clicking on and off the closed caption button, which is on the right-hand corner of your Zoom screen if you don't wanna see it. And at the uh, conclusion of the webinar, there will be some announcements before we turn off, uh, including some very important information about our next uh, uh, upcoming webinar, which will take place at the end of the month of May. So don't jump off prematurely. And finally, of course, tomorrow, I'll say this later, There'll be a follow-up mailing that comes automatically. Uh, it'll help you to be in touch with the AJA to receive, if you wish, a recording of our uh, webinar. 
and upcoming educational experiences and offerings from the American Jewish Archives and the Hebrew Union College. Uh, so uh, uh, I'll tell you more about that when we're ending. Now, without any further delay, uh, let me introduce our wonderful uh, guest teacher for this afternoon. Harold Holzer is currently the Jonathan F. Banton Director of Hunter College's Roosevelt House Public Policy Institute. And he has authored, as many of you know, uh, or co-authored or edited at least 54 books. This one that we're talking about today may be 55 for all I know. And as I noted a minute ago, uh, Mr. Holzer is unquestionably one of this country's preeminent authorities on Abraham Lincoln and the political culture of the Civil War era. In, uh, in 2015, this attainment was recognized when Mr. Holzer received the prestigious Gilder Lehrman Lincoln Prize. He's a prolific author friend. He's a lecturer and a frequent guest and commentator on television. And in fact, as I've said to Harold myself, I know many of us have enjoyed watching and learning from Harold when he recently served as one of the distinguished scholars who appeared on CNN's original documentary series titled, Lincoln, Divided We Stand. You know, in 2006, President Bill Clinton appointed Harold Holzer to serve as the co-chair of the U.S. Abraham Bicentennial Commission, which was established to help our nation commemorate the bicentennial anniversary of Abraham Lincoln's birth in 2009. It was because of this that I was fortunate enough to meet Harold, for I was able to serve as a member of the Academic Advisory Council for that commission. And we have been friends ever since. And I wanna say publicly to all of you who know me that I owe Harold Holzer a large debt of gratitude for the help and the support that he proffered when I was writing and trying to publish my volume on Lincoln and American Jewry. In 2008, President George Bush awarded Harold Holzer the National Humanities Medal for his manifold contributions to the life of the mind. And so this, his later, latest major book, the Presidents versus the Press. This is uh, just another uh, a, a, a star in his uh, crown of contributions to the world of learning. This book, uh, the New York Times itself has called a panoramic, a panoramic survey of this very interesting topic. I'd ask uh, uh, Harold to focus especially on the topics of interest relating to American Jewish history, and I know he will do that. So friends, it is now my honor and my personal pleasure to present to all of you, Mr. Harold Holzer, who will be teaching us about the presidents, the press, and American Jewry. Harold, it's all yours. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Dr. Zola. Um, we have done programs together in the um, historic Miami and in, in at, at the Jacob Rader Center. It's wonderful to reunite with you. I only wish we could do it uh, in person. Uh, I have put your, your wonderful book in my background here as an inducement to securing a future in-person invitation. I think I was there in 2016 with you for a Lincoln conference that you organized, which was memorable and wonderful. And you know, it has been, a difficult year for all of us. Um, it's fabulous to have had the technology making communication possible. It's been sort of depressing to be doing it all from home and arranging our backgrounds fastidiously. Um, but uh, you have given me uh, new inspiration because you challenged me to focus uh, my research, which was so broad for the book, The Presidents Versus the Press, which is subtitled from the founding fathers to fake news. So it 
truth and advertising it covered the panoply but where do we talk about how this story fits into american jewish history it was an interesting challenge because frankly most of the time it doesn't so it's worth looking at the exceptions where does one start maybe with um, george washington's letter to the uh, children of the stock of abraham at Turo synagogue in newport rhode island which i believe was published in the press and certainly lives as the first example of an American president's uh, uh, declaration as president that all men are created equal and all men and, and women are, are equal Americans. Um, I hesitate to talk about my next obvious president in the litany, Abraham Lincoln, because I think it would be more useful. I just say one or two things and then Dr. Zola and I talk about Lincoln together because that's what we've done for 10 years, talk about Lincoln together and his impact on, uh, uh, on, the, on American Jewry and on, on Jewish leaders' impact on Lincoln, either in the case of creating um, uh, uh, Jewish army chaplains for the first time in American history, um, to the potential uh, but still controversial matter of the influence of his Jewish doctor. Um, uh, uh, a foot doctor who might have become something more to Lincoln. Uh, the idea of whether a Jewish vote existed during the Lincoln administration. And of course, to order number 11, the infamous order by General Grant banishing Jews as a class from an entire region of the country and actually at least beginning a pogrom that was aptly condemned in the Jewish press but still required a visit from Jewish leaders to get Lincoln quietly to countermand it because he did not want to um, he did not want to uh, uh, embarrass his most valuable military man, even though he was so misdirected. Um, I think we have to admit, and and Gary, you and I can talk about it later, that the Jewish press, um, as fascinating as it is, and of course it breaks down the way Americans broke down. There are Republican Jewish newspapers, there are Democratic Jewish newspapers, there are Northern papers, there are Southern papers. What, what strikes me as worth discussing is the reaction that many Jewish newspapers and Jewish leaders had to the Emancipation Proclamation, um, invoking, I hope, mostly fear that the elevation of another oppressed race might further endanger the Jewish people standing in America. That's the way I read some of the plaintive opposition to emancipation, which is, is pretty bad in some cases. And it's white supremacist, but we can discuss that. I, um, um, looking at the Jewish record and other Harold, it looks like you're frozen. If you can hear me, seems like uh, we have you frozen. So uh, friends, I think we're just gonna have to wait a minute and see if we can get uh, Harold to come back on. Otherwise I'm going to, uh, you're, you're, you don't be disappointed. I, I actually have something prepared but uh, hopefully he'll be back on. Yes, he's, uh, he'll, he'll exit. I think he has exited. Uh, and uh, we hope he'll come back on. Uh, Lisa, why don't you, um, if you can, why don't you put up the slide on Lincoln and we'll, uh, I'll talk people through that it, it, since that's what Harold was speaking about when, you know, I don't feel so bad about this uh, because uh, I've, I've been watching this uh, very same thing happen uh, on, um, on uh, national television, you know, when uh, they're, uh, 
Uh, yes, there you are. There you are. Go back one. Go backwards one. Okay, so uh, Lisa, you can also see if you can reach out to, to Harold. Uh, and I will talk a little bit about what you have here and what Harold was talking about just when he froze is uh, this is an article, as you can see, from the American Israelite. And uh, this is, of course, uh, the newspaper. Oh, hold on. Hold on. I'm getting a phone call from Harold. Yes, Harold, I don't, all of a sudden you froze. So you have to come, come back on. Well, no, we're still on. We're still on. Uh, and I see that there's 338 people. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Now try again. See if. Uh huh. I mean, have you have you turned your computer off and started again? Yeah. Maybe maybe your phone. Try on your phone. Okay. Okay. All right, friends. He's he. Uh, if anybody's having any trouble with Zoom, uh, send that to us in. Ch uh, here come. Uh, there's there you are. There you are. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. The connection. Uh, I, I must have said something disobliging to Cincinnati to be cut off from New York, but I hope not. Well, uh, I was actually Harold. I was just showing the the uh, the, the folks uh, uh, that article that you and I were discussing. I didn't really get into it, but I was about to show them the article since you were talking just before you got cut off about Lincoln briefly. Uh, I did show them Isaac Wise's uh, uh, little essay where he uh, we'll we'll look at it if we have time again. Where he he uh, he is very critical of uh, Abraham Lincoln's ability to speak so uh, and to write. So right. we'll get back to that. Okay, that's where, we, that's where we left off. All right, I I hope I will try not to touch anything and, and continue. <laughs> and yes, Rabbi Wise thought him as he said a primitive. So he was not it was not a fan. Um, but it was a period of, of to understand the sensitivity a period of manifest anti-Semitism in the press and in the country, as we know, Jews were blamed for everything from prices, uh, price gouging, sh uh, shortages of supplies, uh, faulty materials, uh, shoddy blankets and uh, uh, military uh, accoutrements. And uh, th there's a wonderful story about a man named Edward Bernays. I assume he's related to the famous Bernays family. He was named, um, Lincoln rewarded many newspaper people, including uh, Jewish newspaper people to, uh, to diplomatic posts. And Bernays was named the consul to Zurich. And when he got there, uh, the, the hosts did not want to receive him because of his Jewish heritage. And the irony was that by this time, Bernays was a Lutheran. So I, it may have served him right, but uh, um, we can talk about Lincoln and Dr. Zachary, who I'm eager to talk to you about, but I'll switch to the later part of the century and talk about the presidents that we have not spoken about, Gary. And um, keep in mind that all of the press of the 19th century is political. It's openly aligned with political parties, uh, really cogs in the political machine. There are democratic newspapers in Cincinnati and Cleveland and in New York uh, and Republican papers. And citizens who walk around with their newspapers under their arms are easily identifiable as members of a, of a party, anti-slavery or pro-slavery as the case may be. That changed a bit in 1896 when Adolf Ox, uh, who had purchased the Chattanooga Times at age 19, 
uh, cobbled together something like $65,000 to purchase bargain basement sale, a failing Republican newspaper in New York, uh, a 40 year old enterprise called the New York Times, whose founder had died suddenly in the late 1860s, while he was serving as a congressman, by the way, to show you that newspaper men were politicians and politicians were newspaper men. And he bought the New York Times and brought a new ethos to political journalism. And uh, it may have vanished more recently in all media, but it was print the news fairly and editorialize at will. And that ethos spread a bit and then ran into the other phenomenon called uh, front page journalism, sensationalist journalism and yellow journalism. And um, one of the most influential of those sensationalist journalists, one who had had a hand uh, at importuning the United States into uh, the Spanish-American War, perhaps without just cause, because most modern scholars believe the main exploded on its very own without sabotage or attack. And one of these uh, uh, purveyors of hysteria, big headlines, blaring headlines, uh, was a, uh, a, a man uh, born to the Jewish faith named Joseph Pulitzer. Uh, and his New York world remained deeply influential, um, uh, sensationalistic, and the first president of the, of the 20th century, if we uh, give McKinley his due for the first couple of months of the century, was Theodore Roosevelt. He could not have been the, a more perfect person for that time because he was a front page chaser. He knew how to do trial balloons, use the bully pulpit, leak stories. He invited journalists into his office every day to get quotes from him as he was being shaved by his barber. He loved dealing with the press, but he, he hated Joseph Pulitzer and he hated the New York world. And the first time it cropped up was uh, right before Thanksgiving when Roosevelt's uh, you know, obnoxious little boys decided to chase around the White House lawn the turkey that was scheduled to be pardoned by TR. And they were torturing the turkey, running around after it uh, waving their arms at the poor bird. And Teddy was in the window. You know, he liked to be a boy himself when he was with his sons, encouraging them. So the, the White House correspondent of the New York World wrote about it, and Roosevelt went berserk. First, he denied it happened, and everybody had observed it happening. And then he banned the New York World from his briefings and even refused to deliver press releases to them. And he would have kept the ban going uh, he had a, a club called the Ananias Club, uh, to, named after a biblical figure who had betrayed, uh, um, I forgot who it is now, is it uh, St. Peter or so lied to one of uh, Jesus's apostles. And anyone who, was, who, he, he, who um, displeased him was put into this purgatory. It took the other journalists to get him out of the Ananias Club. But worse for Roosevelt, was when the New York world joined a few other papers in charging that Roosevelt had financially benefited from the deal to build a Panama Canal on the Isthmus of Panama. Roosevelt um, called the world wickedly and wantonly guilty and actually began a libel action against the New York world. And in December, 1908, his final message to Congress he devoted part of it, it's like the equivalent of a state of the union, to denouncing Pulitzer and the New York world. He called, he said it was a high national duty, and I quote here, to bring to justice this vilifier of the American people who seeks to blacken the character of reputable private citizens and convict the government of his own country in the eyes of the civilized world. I like that little play on words, the civilized world not the New York world, the civilized world. And then Pulitzer shoots right back and says that Roosevelt, if Roosevelt succeeds, it will place every newspaper in the country completely at the mercy of any autocratic, vainglorious president who is willing to prostitute his authority for the glorification of his personal malice. Eventually the AG did indict Pulitzer 
couldn't quite bring himself to say he libeled the sitting president. So this was the technicality. Since the papers were mailed to some generals who subscribed to them at West Point, Pulitzer was indicted for violating a century old law that protect American fortifications from malicious injury. Now that's pretty trumped up, again, no pun intended on my part, but this case lasted for three years before the Supreme Court threw it out, by which time Roosevelt was planning a comeback. So that's my TR story. Woodrow Wilson, of course, had support uh, during his presidency from the Jewish press, after all, for appointing the first Jewish uh, Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, Louis Brandeis, deservedly so. But he didn't have an easy time when he ran in 1912 against TR, because he had written in his History of the American People uh, of his own, well, he disparaged recent waves of immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe. They were not like the Germans, he said. They were riffraff. And the head of the Foreign Press Association said no man who has an iron heart like Woodrow Wilson and who slanders his fellow men because they seek a better life in this land of opportunity deserves to be president of the United States. Wilson offered a feeble defense that he had meant only to disparage organized immigration by corporations seeking cheap labor. But if you go back and compel yourself to read the history of the American people, it really wasn't what he said. So he had a burden. He had to prove himself um, a man who believed in equality. Uh, he, he, I think he redeemed himself over the years with the Jewish press, but did a terrible job, it might be said parenthetically, with the black press. Um, he would not allow any black journalists to interview him until one finally came, William Monroe Trotter. They all but came to blows in the Oval Office, and that was the last um, interchange he had with an African-American reporter. Well, let's skip to FDR, um, who's now my president, Gary, because I work, when we work in person, at Roosevelt House, which I'm eager to show you next time you're in New York. It is the private home in New York City where Franklin and Eleanor lived for 25 years. It, I know we hear mostly about Hyde Park, but it served as their New York City base, election night headquarters. And for the months between November 1932 and his departure for his inauguration in March, in those days, 1933, it was the transition headquarters. It was the Trump Tower of uh, 1932. It's just a few blocks away from Trump Tower. And of course, um, there were Jewish intellectuals and government experts in the Brains Trust that worked in our second floor library to put together the building blocks uh, that became the foundation of the New Deal. So it's for us quite a sacred space. It's also uh, one floor, uh, I'm sorry, on the same floor as the library is a, uh, a second floor parlor. And on the day after his election, having not gotten a concession from Herbert Hoover in a timely fashion, even though it was a rout in 1932, FDR was wheeled into the parlor lifted into a, a wing chair in front of the fireplace. And from that spot delivered a very brief address on radio to the American people, assuring them that he would be their champion in the dark hour of the depression. And then Fox movie tone news moved in and he repeated the message, did a little better the second time for the newsreels. I know we think of Roosevelt as a radio president. He was also an extraordinary present, presence in the nation's movie houses and millions of people went to the movies each week during the depression as well. Um, so um, the first fireside chat happened at Roosevelt House. It isn't counted in the official litany, but let me skip to his relationships with the press who were a, a, a varied bunch, all white, mostly men, um, but um, um, Roosevelt functioned within a bubble, a gentleman's agreement by photographers never to take his picture when he was in his wheelchair or struggling to get into an automobile with help or get out or board a train or come off a ship. There's a famous story during the war when someone did take a picture as he was helped down a gangplank and the Secret Service pulled the film out of the camera because it was wartime and he could get away with it. But 
in those days, a gentleman's agreement. Roosevelt did hold 998 press conferences and charmed the journalists, just charmed them. Even though he, if you read the transcripts, as I have all thousand, he could be pretty bullying. Um, the way we were kind of became used to Donald Trump berating reporters who asked disobliging questions. He would say, that's a stupid question. Go stand in the corner and wear a dunce cap. I'm not even going to dignify that with, a, with an answer. But he also kibitzed with them. And uh, especially the senior guys, the press conferences took place in the Oval Office in front of his, circling his desk. Um, and um, uh, his press secretary, by the way, was the descendant of a, a Confederate general. Name was Stephen Early, descendant of Jubal Early. So it took 11 years for the color, color barrier to be broken in those press conferences. And just think of it, while he's having them, Eleanor is having 800 press conferences of her own to an all women uh, group and appearing on the radio on the Lux Theater and other commercial enterprises. So this was a family that was on the radio. And I want to go back a little bit to the uh, 28 fireside chats that were so important to people who lived through the depression and World War II, so reassuring, so intimate. I mean, he knew how to use radio the way Jack Benny did and Bob Hope did. It was not easy. If you listen to other politicians of the day, they're shouting outdoor political speeches at what, well, Alfred Landon in 1936 called the radio, but Roosevelt, was an, a brilliant performer on on uh, on on radio. Uh, just uh, and and you know all of these are accessible online. If you're curious about what inspired our parents and grandparents, and perhaps even some people on on Zoom today have recollections of hearing his his late fireside chats. They're brilliant. They're reassuring. Um, he did have his critics. There was a a, a, a journal a journalist named uh, Eugene Levy. No, no relation to the Canadian comedian who's so famous now in a show whose title I don't think I can bring myself to mention on, on, at, H, at Hebrew Union College, but um, it, no relation. And he vilified Roosevelt and vilified the journalist for being stupid enough to be taken in by his act. So he did have critics. Back to the fireside chats, I know I'm going back and forth. They sounded spontaneous. Um, and uh, by the way, they too were delivered in front of a fireplace that was unlit through all of those 12 years. But they were meticulously prepared by, uh, by three people, Harry Hopkins, uh, Roosevelt's closest assistant, later Robert Emmett Sherwood, uh, and Gary, you'll know him as the playwright who won the Pulitzer Prize for Abe Lincoln in Illinois and was quickly recruited to the speechwriting staff of Roosevelt to get Lincoln into his speeches. Um, and, and the, the other person worth noting, since we want to talk about American Jewry and its relation to communications, was Samuel Rosenman, a speechwriter of great talent who, uh, who was the one who told everyone there was no fire in the fireplace, but wrote a book called Working with Roosevelt, still available uh, on, uh, on uh, Amazon used books and a wonderful reminiscence of what it was like working with a communications genius, meaning Franklin Roosevelt. Let me spend a few minutes on Richard Nixon. I know I'm skipping around and we can use Q&A to talk about others. Um, as we know, Nixon's enemies list uh, was certainly populated with, with Jews, Jewish journalists among them, like Bernard and, and Marvin Kalb, still going strong, those brothers in their 90s, Daniel Shore, uh, Frank Mankiewicz, uh, one of my great favorites as a young man reading the old New York Post, Max Lerner, all of them put on Nixon's enemies list. Um, I guess it's interesting that two Jewish people were in a, in a sense responsible for Nixon's undoing uh, in the end. One, uh, Daniel Ellsberg, who of course was responsible for getting the Pentagon Papers Xeroxed and however you feel about that that breach of confidence, Nixon referred to him, by the way, as the Jew. Um, and uh, the other uh, Im most critically important journalist of the post-Watergate era, of course, well, the Watergate era, was Carl Bernstein, 
who is also still going strong, as is his, his partner, Bob Woodward. I came across one of his taped uh, meetings that I wanted to read a bit of. Uh, I, I've always found it extraordinary that Johnson and Nixon insisted on taping some of their vilest phone conversations and meetings. And uh, of course, it became Nixon's undoing when his uh, smoking gun tape, How to Be Surrendered to the House Judiciary Committee. But this is Richard Nixon sitting in a meeting with Billy Graham, no less, a man of God, right? And this is what Nixon says, I might add, without objection from Billy Graham. In fact, I'll read you his comment at the end. Okay, this, and, and to make matters worse, this is right after Reverend Graham had led a White House prayer breakfast. Okay, this is Nixon. Life magazine, you know, is totally dominated by the Jews. Newsweek is totally owned by Jews and dominated by the Jews. The New York Times, the Washington Post are totally Jewish. The ownership of the Los Angeles Times is now totally Jewish. Um, poor Owen Chandler, he's the publisher of the LA Times, who sits on the top of the heap. The three networks, they have their front men. They have Howard K. Smith or Brinkley or Cronkite who may not be of that persuasion, but the writers, 95% are Jewish. Now, what does this mean? Does this mean that all the Jews are bad? No, it does mean that most Jews are left wing. They're way out, they're radical, they're for peace at any price, except where the support of Israel is concerned. And Billy Graham responds, this ugly stranglehold has got to be broken or this country is gonna go down the drain. And Nixon in a hopeful voice says, do you believe that, Billy? Yes, sir, Graham re responds. Boy, Nixon says, I can never say it though, but I believe it. And then Graham ends it by saying, well, if you've been elected a second time, you might be able to do something. That's about as chilling a conversation about alleged Jew Jewish control of the media uh, that I, I ever heard. That's why I sort of think it's poetic justice that Carl Bernstein had the last word. Um, Dr. Zola challenged me to tell him and tell all of you how many uh, Jewish Americans served as press secretaries or communications directors. It was not an easy task. You know, there were 33 communications directors in the history of the White House, and it really began with Nixon. Uh, the only Jewish uh, uh, communications director I was able to find among the 37, I think I said 33, 37, is Ann Lewis, who worked for Bill Clinton and is now chair of a group called Democratic Majority for Israel. There were some who sounded Jewish, but they weren't. Um, same for press secretaries. There was not a Jewish press secretary from the time of FDR uh, when the title was established, but you can go back uh, further, if you wish, to the informally named press aides until George W. Bush appointed Ari Fleischer. And I recommend um, his book to you. Um, I read it from cover to cover. I've met him. Um, and I think, <coughs> I think it's an antidote, in a way, to what Richard Nixon believed, that all Jewish media people are left wing because Ari Fleischer bemoaned the left-wing media, but didn't castigate or didn't identify it as Jewish. He just identified it as liberal. Anyway, Ari was number one. We're waiting for number two someday, someday. Um, Barack Obama, just one word about him. Before the age of Trump, I found it fascinating to read comments by journalists, Jewish and non-Jewish, who concluded that Barack Obama was the most oppressive um, um, person when it came to the press, censor, than any since Woodrow Wilson. And one of the people who tells the tale is James Rosen of Fox News, whom the State Department suspected of passing information uh, about Korean intelligence. He was wiretapped, <coughs> he, his family, were wiretapped under a sedition law that had been enacted solely for World War I. I should have noted that uh, during World War I, Woodrow Wilson closed down the Jewish Daily Forward. I forgot that. That's an interesting, an interesting 
tidbit. Well, um, I, I won't even deal with the Trump era because I want to get to Dr. Zola in questions, but um, you know, it's a different world now. The they, media is not just controlled, in fact, by professional journalists. We're in a kind of a free-for-all uh, with, with the brave new world of a weakened print press, a rampant uh, and very uh, politicized television media and an emboldened internet where boundaries, well, we just saw Facebook has some boundaries, but some uh, websites have no boundaries. Um, where hatred can hide behind a false name or a false premise uh, or a fake identity or a meme, anything is possible. So I think in, in days past, we could depend on crusading investigative journalists to be our watchdogs um, for abuses, both abuses by the White House in curtailing freedom of the press and abuses by the press in politicizing and propagandizing. Now I think we're each our own warrior, our own safeguard. Uh, the, the World Wide Web requires us. Um, it requires us to do the watching for ourselves. And I can only hope that we're all up to the task. Thank you. That, that was wonderful, Harold. Uh, you know, I love your stories, uh, you know, I, I, I always feel that great historians are fundamentally those who know how to tell a good story. And uh, I enjoyed it. I, I, I want to, before we turn to a few things where you and I can talk, I, I, I want to first again invite folks. I see some people, Harold, have been asking questions and our, uh, uh, my, my loyal compatriot at the American Jewish Archives, Lisa Frankel, is, is uh, going to put those together. Um, but you actually did make me think of a question that actually has nothing really to do with uh, American Jewish history, but it popped into my mind uh, when you were speaking about uh, Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, I'm thinking about uh, the James Cagney movie uh, and uh, the, the song about uh, it's strictly off the record. And I wondered, is, is Roosevelt, was he the first really to make use of that technique? What, do you, what can you say about it's strictly off the record. I love that. I actually printed some of the lyrics in the book. Of course, that's uh, George M. Cohan, uh, not Jewish, uh, uh, Irish, uh, Cohan, I would like to be called. Um, right. I think that it's called I'd Rather Be Right. Um, and Cohan came out of retirement to play an FDR type. And Jimmy Cagney, of course, uh, reproduced that wonderful off the record song. Uh, um, with a new lyric uh, that Hitler has ants in his pants. That was added for the movie. Um, Roosevelt, uh, FDR wasn't the first. Um, I guess uh, through Roosevelt, actually through Eisenhower, everything was off the record unless the president agreed to put it on the record. So Wilson held news conferences with pre-submitted written questions. Uh, Hoover written questions. Roosevelt was the first to allow spontaneous questioning during the press conferences, but he had to be asked, can we put that, can we put that on the record? So that's why he, uh, uh, they attributed it to him. And of course, the first press conference and only the first of the 998 was on radio. So people heard the term, this is all off the record, even though he was speaking to hundred million people basically. <laughs> So it was identified with him, but no, he wasn't. It wasn't the first. It was all people. It was Eisenhower who held the first live televised news conference from a, you know, we all know now from Zoom, right? Don't have a window behind us. It's the worst lighting to, to have for a Zoom. Eisenhower stood in front of a big window. Maybe it was good because it didn't show how old he was, but he was, and he was crabby. He said, well, I guess we'll try this and see how bad it is. And Later, he, he said, I'm, I'm here to be nailed to the cross again uh, in another press conference. I, I didn't find that until after I wrote the book. So um, uh, the first person to enjoy on the record press conferences for sure was John Kennedy. I, I remember that myself. Uh, just a couple other questions before we go to an interesting story that, uh, and, and then to our questions. Uh, 
you know, I, I think it should be pointed out that uh, uh, Jews uh, uh, may not have always, um, uh, you know, played a high profile role in, in uh, the media with the presidents. But, you know, uh, I, I can say that uh, it, it, Jews, uh, their, their role, it, it can be very influential and important in interesting ways. I know from my own study, for example, Harold of, uh, of uh, Isaac Harvey of Charleston, who was a newspaper man, and of course, one of the founders of the first expression of Reform Judaism. Uh, interesting, in the South, in 1824, as an editor of a newspaper, he writes uh, 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 defending Andrew Jackson. He becomes a Jacksonian, and you you know the the whole story of why wouldn't he be a Calhoun supporter instead of a Jackson supporter? It, it was recently discussed uh, by a scholar. It's a, an article about to come out. It's, it, it, but in other words it's a different kind of media impact. Uh, this is uh, to jump into a very recent uh, comparison. You may know about when uh, President Obama was uh, running for president in 08 uh, and uh, there was this huge controversy about Reverend Wright. It was uh, Rabbi Arnold Jacob Wool, who was his neighbor, uh, who sent out a note uh, which was picked up all over the country basically saying, you know, I know this man, he's my neighbor. I remember. And, and uh, of course, uh, 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 tragically, uh, Rabbi Wolf passed away uh, either right before he was inaugurated or, or shortly thereafter. But uh, these are interesting ways in which Jews uh, ha have been involved. Uh, you know, Jonathan Sarna uh, constantly says the story of the Jewish role in the newspaper and, you know, in media, it, it, meaning really particularly the, the printed press is, is, is an undertold story. Uh, well, but it, it, I, I agree with you and, and with Jonathan, but you have to say that it was a almost an intentionally submerged or quiet story. People had opinions, but they weren't always Jewish opinions. There were political opinions, as you say, and there were Jacksonians and there were Calhounites and there were Webster and Clay people. So, and Jews could be in any of those camps depending on their region, their politics. So yeah, it's a fascinating story. Well, uh, friends who are listening, we're about to turn to questions and Lisa's gonna do that. But before we, we do that, uh, I, I, I thought I'd share with, since we heard a little bit about Theodore Roosevelt and Pulitzer, uh, I wanna share an interesting story that some of you may have heard. So if Lisa, you don't mind putting up the slides about uh, 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 Theodore Roosevelt, uh, uh, I want to show everybody this very quickly. Uh, where, there you go, stop right there. So this, these are two caricatures of a man by the name of Herman Allworth. And Allworth was a, a, a very unsavory human being uh, character who uh, uh, stole money in the late 1880s, a German stole money from a child's Christmas party, went to jail for this, and uh, uh, then uh, starts a whole new career uh, publicly by becoming, in those years, this was popular political position, and an anti-Semite, a political anti-Semite. He uh, Very briefly, he, he begins his career by arguing that a Jewish gun manufacturer had manufactured faulty gun for the German army in order to uh, uh, cause uh, the Germans not to be able to defend themselves. And he becomes very famous. And it, he actually gets uh, elected to the uh, Reichstag and he becomes, a, a, if you will, a member of parliament. And at this time, he decides he's gonna come to America in 1895 and have a speaking tour where he, of all places in New York, he's going to speak about uh, anti-Semitism. And uh, uh, Lisa, if you go to the next slide, in uh, 1895, the New York Times reports on Allworth's uh, arrival in New York and that he wants to speak at Cooper Union and, and he wants to promote his anti-Semitic rhetoric. And I, I can't present you with the entire article here, but what I'm showing you is that uh, a little bit is that all the, the entire article, it goes on for columns, describes 
the entire visit, and there's no mention of anything having to do with Jewish policemen. There's no story at all about this. Uh, and uh, uh, he, he apparently gets a very unwelcome reception from the American public to begin with, uh, according to the New York Times. If you go to the next article, two year, the, uh, Lisa, two years later in the New York Times, we find that Theodore Roosevelt, who at that time was the police commissioner, as you see, was speaking at the dedication of the Hebrew Technical Institute uh, on a Friday afternoon. And as you see from this little paragraph that I put before you, uh, President, uh, future President Roosevelt uh, tells the story to this Judy Jewish audience that when all words came to New York, uh, the Jewish community came and said, don't let this man speak, he's an anti-Semite. And Roosevelt said, I explained to them that we couldn't do that in America. But what I did do, he says, is I sent a cordon, if you see at the last line, a cordon of 40 officers to preserve the peace at the rally. And they were all Hebrews. In other words, that Roosevelt tells the audience, I got back at this anti-Semite by making all the policemen who came to protect him Jews. Now, it's impossible to know whether he's making this up or whether uh, it, it was left out of the original article, but this became very famous story and American Jews became very proud of Theodore Roosevelt and that one for him, great affection from the American Jewish community. If you go to the next slide, Lise, uh, in his book, his autobiography, which was published in 1913, Roosevelt actually embellishes the story. <laughs> I won't go into it, but he goes on and on and, and describes it in greater detail and, and why he did this and what the message is behind his decision to do this. And, uh, the uh, last slide, Lisa, I think, uh, oh, no, 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 this is fine. Uh, it, it, you see that I published, this is published from the New York Times in 1938. It, it, but in, in this 1938 article, he, it, it refers to the Roosevelt autobiography. And the whole purpose of this is to show that to this day, there are people who believe this story and who are very fond of uh, President Roosevelt and believe that he protected the Jewish community. And yet uh, we're not sure whether this ever happened, but it's an interesting use of the media to, in a sense, to promote this in his book and in his uh, speeches that uh, this is how he got back at the anti-Semite all right. So uh, we can take that down and Lisa, come on to the screen and uh, let's ask some questions if you don't mind. Uh, what, what uh, some of the people would like uh, Harold Holzer to answer. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Lisa Frankel, who is the uh, Director of Educational Outreach at the American Jewish Archives. We've worked together for 36 years, which is double high. So uh, Lisa, <laughs> what, uh, what, what uh, I don't know if it's double high for Lisa, but uh, it is for me. So what, what, what kind of questions have been asked? Um, one of the questions was, JTA says Herbert Klein was a Jewish White House communications director for Nixon. What do you know about Klein? So, you know, I, he was the first ever communications director. Um, and I did my due diligence about Herbert Klein. Um, and there is no mention of his uh, religion in Wikipedia, in any of my Nixon books, in um, his New York Times obituary. There are a couple of, uh, uh, you know, German born uh, folks along the way who I actually had hopes for, but turned out to be non-Jews. I'm not sure about Klein. Um, if anybody knows for sure, if you, uh, someone, the questioner said that the JTA, well, that may be dispositive if JTA says it. <laughs> we'll add him to the list and he's the first. How about this for a new lead? After Herb Klein, they never had another Jewish communications director until Ann Lewis. That could be my new way of presenting. 
Another question that came up was, was Roosevelt a closet anti-Semite? Was he acting from fear when he sent the St. Louis back to Europe? Wow. Um, you know, even not to bring this up gratuitously, but if you even look back at some of the early letters of Eleanor Roosevelt, one of the great uh, um, creators of the international human rights movement, she uses an occasional haphazard term for Jews. I mean, I think they were people of their class and they made, you know, in their early days made casual references that we would be very hurt by. Um, I don't think Roosevelt was an anti-Semite. Uh, um, I think he was taken in by the State Department, by Cordell Hall and others who thought, and I mean, are we not living in the same time now? If you bring refugees into this country, you have crime, you have uh, competition for jobs, you have a, a, an unbalanced society. We hear it now about uh, brown people coming from Central America, the same arguments that we used about uh, the St. Louis. Um, I'd rather talk about the Kwanzaa. I, so St. Louis is a terrible story. The Kwanzaa is a less known story. I'm sure Rabbi Zola knows about it, but the Kwanzaa was another ship filled with Jewish refugees that, that sailed out of Lisbon not long after the St. Louis was pushed back and it too was denied entry in New York. And I think in Florida, it went on to Cuba, it went on and Eleanor this time put her foot down and the St. Louis, the Kwanzaa came back and uh, disgorged all the Jewish refugees in Newport News, Virginia, um, which is the where the Civil War Battle of the Monitor and Merrimack took place, a totally unrelated, but a historic town. And um, that's a wonderful story. We had an event at Roosevelt House um, and one of the attendees was a very elderly lady who not only had been on the Kwanzaa, but had a picture of herself leaning out of the porthole and waving. It's like that Norman Rockwell painting of a little girl on a bus. And she was the little girl in the painting. So. Well, that's, yeah. it's, it's good to know that the Roosevelt House and the American Jewish Archives think along the same line because, you know, there's a documentary film that was made on it recently and we, sh we, we had a webinar on it. So And we uh, screened it while we were still open and had the filmmakers. That's, that's why we had the, uh, the survivor. Okay, well, we're in good company, you know. Uh, it's a good film. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, what, uh, it, it's, I see that it's five. I want to let the uh, audience know we're not going to go on forever, but we'll, we'll wrap up, I promise you, no later than uh, 510. So you, you know, you, I just want you to know I'm attentive to your time. Uh, you know, uh, what, what do you, uh, why don't you say a few words about uh, Lincoln uh, and the brutality that he endured uh, it, it's not always well known how uh, much uh, this person who has become something of a demigod after, you know, what they call the apotheosis of, of Lincoln. Uh, but uh, many people are unaware of how brutally he was treated by the press. And uh, this is a story we, you and I were going to talk about, but I don't think we have all the time right. to it. One, I, you know, Rabbi Isaac Mayer Wise, the founder of the Hebrew Union College, who had his own newspaper, was frequently uh, uh, critical of, uh, of, uh, of President Lincoln, made fun of the way he spoke. At one point, just uh, 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 months before he died, referred to him as an imbecile uh, and, and his actions as imbecility. And uh, uh, of course, that didn't stop uh, uh, Wise from uh, referring to him as the Messiah of America after he died and, yeah. and, 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 and even suggest that he was a Jew. Uh, but uh, why, what do you think, uh, tell us a little, you know, what your thoughts are uh, about, uh, 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 you know, the, the uh, brutality with which the press treated Lincoln. Well, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna diverge from your perspective a little bit because right. in my previous book, Lincoln and the Power of the Press, I looked into this and Lincoln gave as good as he got, okay? He was living in a highly politicized journalistic environment. Growing up as a young man and even in his New Salem days, he was writing rip-roaring, ascetic, sarcastic editorials castigating Democrats. And the Democrats were criticizing him. Not enough probably for his 
taste because he wanted to be more famous. He and his future wife wrote such a sarcastic article about a, uh, a man named James Shields, a Democratic office holder in Illinois, um, insulting him uh, as, a, as a, a laughable would-be Romeo, that James Shields challenged Abraham Lincoln to a duel. They went off to an island on the Mississippi where dueling was legal and chose Lincoln chose broadswords as a weapon and then began shearing off tree limbs to practice. And then suddenly Shields said, well, why don't we just shake hands and go on? But Lincoln got into trouble for that kind of brutal, sarcastic teasing. It was part of the press culture of the time. So I don't think, you know, in the end, was Lincoln tre treated more brutally? He was treated more often than others. So he was, but Stephen Douglas was lambasted by the Republican press when he was Lincoln's foe. They lived in a town with two thriving newspapers, a Democratic one and a Republican one. And Douglas was once walking down the street and hit the Lincoln guy with a cane. And the Lincoln guy then threw him into the muddy streets and they were rolling around as a crowd gathered. Lincoln, nobody messed with Lincoln physically, but, um, uh, so it was that kind of culture. And Lincoln, uh, he stopped being that kind of a anonymous journalist himself when he became more well known. But his press supporters were as brutal to his opponents all through his presidency. And he also had a pro-Republican press that lionized him uh, in the same period from his Illinois days as a, as a, you know, a Senate aspirant through his election. Maybe they were a little less certain when he issued the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, when he seemed too much a liberator for period taste in the, in the West, particularly in Chicago and Springfield. But I, my view is that he gave, he, we see him as a saintly figure who deserved none of this, but he was a political figure who gave as good as he got. It's interesting, you know, uh, uh, we all know, or not all of us, but it, it's worth saying that, uh, after Lincoln's death, uh, you know, we, we do have, you know, just, I mean, there's a book filled with uh, sermons of, of, of rabbis and, and Jewish leaders who, you know, spoke so highly of him. Uh, I, 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 my, in my research, you know, we, we did find uh, some criticism of him during his life, but I, I don't recall offhand any of the Jewish newspaper owners who, be, who, who become his you know, his uh, like a, a fabulous or, uh, or, or tremendous uh, uh, boosters of Lincoln uh, during his life. I agree. Uh, yeah. I mean, th there, are, there are Jews who, who play that role, like, uh, you know, different uh, 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 people like, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, Brandeis's uncle, uh, Naftali uh, Dembitz, uh, who, who plays that role, but, but actual newspaper, Jewish newspaper writers at that time, uh, Lisa or what have you, I, I didn't, they, I, they may not have said much, but the, you know, it's interesting. I think you're right. I mean, it takes Lincoln a long time to meet the demands of, of uh, uh, you know, rational requests. Like, look, he did the, uh, the, the Jewish uh, chaplains, he took care of that issue, but it wasn't immediate. It was like from April to November that they were dithering about it. And that's the way he did emancipation as well. And I think there was, I think it's worth further study, this idea that you've written about and others have um, in, in collections and Sarna has written about it, that there was resistance to the emancipation. It couldn't have been driven by fear of emancipation, which is in the Jewish story, right? It was a fear of being lowered on the totem pole of of uh, acceptance. And yes, it's it's, hard, it, you're right. It's hard for us to, today to understand that, but you know, when you walk into a bifurcated society where you have privilege or you have no privilege and you've come especially from a place where you were in the no privilege, it's uh, uh, one can understand the human instinct of moving towards privilege and not wanting to you know, uh, 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 be sympathetic to those right. who where you once were, exactly. and 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 uh, and uh, that's hard for us today. But we do have to remember uh, in American Jewish history uh, that uh, it, it is true that uh, 
uh, uh, there were Jews, there were rabbis who did speak out. And, and that's what makes those who didn't, uh, it's more problematic. And, you know, if nobody did, then you could say, well, nobody said that. But when you do have some exceptions, then, well, Lisa, tell me if there's- By the way, uh, yeah, go uh, ahead. Jonathan Sarna just signed off. So he has been on this whole time. I'm, I wish I'd I known, I would have, I would have used the teleprompter to see more uh, better. Yeah, well, uh, we, we're a, honored. We have, we have, we're honored to have, uh, uh, to have had Dr. Sarna and his book is uh, filled with magnificent documents is a wonderful. Uh, and so is his said, book. So is his book on Grant's order. It's a little gem. Yeah. I don't even that, have to say that now because he's off. Yeah, Zoom, but that's right. Well, you know, he was my teacher. So, um, uh, uh, I, I hope he gives me a passing grade on today. Uh, uh, Lisa, come back on, Lisa, and let me know if there's any other really good questions. If not, we're going to wrap up. I think that, um, I think you should just wrap up. All right. Okay. Well, then let me do that. Uh, friends, I'm going to wrap up. and uh, Don't leave because you'll be very happy to hear this. Uh, so Lisa is going to put on a, uh, the uh, uh, share screen. Before uh, we conclude, I want to now again take this opportunity to uh, thank Harold Holzer. Harold, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, you were so interesting and so illuminating. And Lisa can tell you, I've been watching you have too. So many people already on the chat have thanked you for such a wonderful hour and we're grateful. Now, friends, you can see a picture of uh, Harold Holzer's new book out of which this material has been drawn. You see it in front of you. And Harold tells me that you can buy this book from, uh, of course, the publisher. You can buy it from Amazon. You can buy it anywhere. Uh, and he was nice enough to say that if you write him, we're going to send you uh, an email address. And if you write him, uh, he will give you a signed uh, a label that you can put inside your book so that you'll have a personalized signed book by Harold Holzer. So that's coming up. Uh, I also want to thank all of you who are still with us for joining us on this terrific webinar. Uh, after all, uh, we all have Zoom overload and I'm delighted that you made time. We want to salute and thank uh, four congregations who have decided to officially co-sponsor and share information about this webinar with the members of their congregations. So I wanna extend a special recognition to Congregation of Reform Judaism in Orlando, Congregation Oheb Sholem in Reading, PA, uh, Temple Israel of the city of New York, and of course, Temple Sinai of North Dade in Miami. Thank you friends for your support. And now I am now delighted to announce that we will have one more special webinar that's going to take place to honor American Jewish Heritage Month. And in this uh, program, which will take place, bear in mind on Wednesday, May the 16th, uh, May the 26th, Wednesday, May the 26th at four o'clock, we will be, believe it or not, we will be jointly uh, marking uh, Jewish American Heritage Month and Asian Pacific Heritage Month. And we'll have the authors of a new book called Jew Asian, wherein we will discuss the past and present context of the relationship between Jewish Americans and the Asian American community here in this country. So mark your calendars, Wednesday, May 26, four o'clock. We will be sending information tomorrow with the follow-up email. Finally, my gratitude, heartfelt gratitude goes to the amazing staff of the American Jewish Archives who help with all of these wonderful learning experiences. And in particular, Lisa Frankel, whose contributions to the American Jewish Archives for the past two and a half decades defy enumeration. Friends, don't forget to listen to, to visit our American Jewish Archives website where you're going to find uh, a recording of today's webinar, 
And of course, that will also be located on the Hebrew Union College's special online learning portal called HUC Connect, which you will find on Hebrew Union College's website. And that will have the same thing, plus a whole array of fascinating learning opportunities. That's huc.edu backslash online learning. So, Carol, thanks a million. We're so grateful to you. I, I really hope it won't be long if I can quote the famous Colonel William uh, Prescott from the Battle of Bunker Hill and modify his famous phrase a little and say, I can't wait to see the whites of your eyes. And, uh, and, and, and for well, I'll, one, I'll modify MacArthur and say, with your permission, I shall return. Wonderful. And uh, to one and to all, let me say shalom, goodbye. And we look forward to seeing you all again in the not too distant future. Thanks again to everybody.